So the footing forms are built. They're in place. They're close. They're not perfect, but they're close. The corners are almost perfect. In between, close counts. We've got the longitudinal bars, the pieces of number four bar, half inch diameter rebar, that are parallel to the footing all around the perimeter. That's pretty easy. There's only a couple things you have to remember with that. You have to have the longitudinal bars in the right place in the footing to absorb the weight that's going to be put on them. You have to have them, the engineer specified, at least three inches away from the bottom of the footing, which puts it in the tension side of the footing. The side of the footing is trying to be pulled apart by the load. And you have to have at least 36, the engineer specifies, bar diameters of lap. The bars have to lap each other at least 36 of their diameters. We're using 40 in all cases, at least. I mean, if you know, there's you can't have too much of a good thing when it comes to rebar overlap, in my opinion. And everything has to be tied into position so it doesn't move when the concrete gets on there, and that's all pretty much a no-brainer. The thing that is not a no-brainer is the location of the verts. The verticals have to come up exactly in the center of the cells of the block. If you miss it, it's a problem. This foundation is resisting loads that are pushing down. Okay, now there will be some hold downs that provide resistance to uplift, but for the sake of our conversation right now, this foundation is holding the world up. These footings are getting their strength, resisting those downward loads from these longitudinal bars, and the strength will continue to grow inside the stem wall because there will be longitudinal bars, bond beams that make the stem wall that's tied to the footing with verts and the longitudinal bars in the bottom of the footing all act together to resist any tendency for this footing, this foundation, to break or to crack with the loads that are put on it, regardless, really, of what the soil may do in one particular spot or another. What I've done here and what I'm going to continue to do for a few minutes is insurance. I'm going to ensure that these footings are in exactly the right spot and I'm doing that by re-establishing the string lines that I put up three days ago before I started building these footings. I want to make sure and measure every single outside dimension and make sure it matches the plan exactly before I put the templates in that I will tie the rebar to. The string lines are up. They are in exactly the right spot at the face of building, according to the plans. I'm confident now that my footings are where they need to be. So the next thing I need to do with the outside of building established with these strings is to determine where the center line of wall is, because the center line of wall is where the rebar verts are going to come up. These spreaders, which up till now have just been holding the footing boards the right width, are now going to begin to hold the template that will tie the, vert the vertical rebar to. Now a template can have a wide, wide scope. It's a term we throw around a lot. It indicates a shape or a pattern or something that someone has already figured out that we can copy or that we can use to get our bearings or recreate something consistently and accurately without a great deal of thought. In this case, it's a two by four that's been put in place meticulously or fairly meticulously with a fair amount of head work and head scratching to make sure it's right so that when the actual work starts, the thinking is over and now it's just work. And that is one of the aspects of a template. The thinking is done once. 
and the produ production can be done over and over. So if you are the least bit uncertain about your rebar layout, if you're going to tackle a project like this and you get the template in the center of the wall but you're not quite sure of the spacing, how far to come in from the corners or what direction they may start their block layout from or exactly where your opening should be located and does that change where the verts should be um, tied in, you need to think very carefully about pressing forward without some real some real certainty that you're getting it right because if it's wrong it can be really wrong and you're bending bars around and the masons are growling and they're cutting the webs out of block or maybe they're cutting the verts off and epoxying new verts in and all of those fixes are expensive and none of them are ever quite as good as if it would have been right the first time so it is not a bad idea to call the mason and say look I'm getting ready to pour these footings you want to come over and check this layout or maybe hey how about if I give you 50 bucks and you just put this layout on here so nobody, especially you, is unhappy once it's in place? And odds are he will say, you know, you're right. I want that stuff right, so why don't I just come out and lay it out? You tie it in, I'll lay it out, and that way everybody's happy. Maybe your general contractor will make that happen. or You know, I don't know how it's going to work for you, but if you're handling some part of this yourself, make sure, make double sure, that your template is right and that your rebar verts are in the right place. With the template in, it's time to put the layout on for the verts. Now the verts are consistent on their spacing on this whole house. It's 48 inches on center. The verts are tying the stem wall to the footing. The stem wall, the verts and the stem wall, the horizontal rebar in the stem wall and the bond beams, a solid grout are what gives the footing, the stem wall, its strength, which grows as it gets taller. The J's, the J-bars, the 90 degree bends at the bottom of these verts tie the verts into the footing permanently so it all works together as a single system. The thing that has to be perfectly understood right now is how to make sure that the verts come out of the footing in the cells, in the opening, in the, center, in the CMU, in the block. If you miss the opening, if the vert comes up in the side or in the web or in the end web, it's just worthless. You're hickeying the bars. You give up the strength of that direct, of that direct lineal tensile strength. It wrecks your project. And so right now, you slow down. You make sure that you know which side of your template is the center of the block. You make sure you know where the end of the wall is. And you lay out on your template the marks you need so that whoever comes behind you to tie this rebar in gets it right. The thing to remember with a cinder block, I call it a cinder block. It's not a cinder block, it's a CMU, a concrete masonry unit. They're not made with cinders anymore. They're made with a much harder aggregate, so they're actually hard and heavy. But the thing to remember is they're 16 inches long. The web in the middle is in the middle at eight inches. And so you have to hit four inch and 12 inch increments from the end of the block, like this. So if we imagine that this first 16 inches is the first block, the end of the block is at the face of the building, right over that green string. The middle of the block, the web, is at 8 inches. And the end of the block is at 16 inches. Now those numbers are approximate. The block is a little shorter than that, but it doesn't matter. I'm 4 inches from the face of the block to the outside of my template, which is where I'm going to tie it. That means if I'm four inches inside in this direction and four inches inside in this direction, a rebar vert right there will be coming up in the center. And a rebar vert eight inches from there is also going to be in the center. You see that? Let's do that one more time. Four inches on the outside is the end of the block. Eight inches is the middle. I don't want it there. I want a vert at four inches or at twelve which is the center of the second cell. I'm going to start at 12, so I'm not trying to hang a vert out here in a corner where it's all tangled up. So 12 inches is my first layout. 
and I'm going to put a C on there, just so if Lenny comes along to tie a piece of rebar, he knows that that on the outside is where the bar goes. Now just to facilitate putting this layout on here, I'm going to put a nail at the center of the cell, and I'll know that every 16 inches on down this wall, there will be another cell waiting to receive a vert. I only need the verts 48 inches on center. So I hook the nail and mark 48, and I'll put a C on it. Eight foot, put a C on it. Clear to the end. 12 foot. We'll do it the same way off of every corner. There's a wall that returns, defines the back of the garage right here. Exactly the same thing. Hang my tape over four inches, coinciding to the outside of bond. 16 inches is the end of the block. That means 12 inches is the center of a cell. And a C. And we'll mark four feet layout. Now, as it happens, I got the bond right on this step, so this is going to be coming in in the first cell of the block that sits down on this first step. So I don't know how this length, where these blocks come together, is going to correspond to bond. That'll be the mason's problem, making the cuts and mitering the corners and making that look nice. But I do know he's going to be coming out of a 90 degree corner right there. So I'm going to start bond layout in this run off of that 90. Overhang four inches and mark 12. And 48, which might even, nope, that's out, that's out of the wall. So I'm gonna put one at 32. Any sort of 16 inch layout will work. That will exceed the requirement, which usually makes the inspector relatively happy. So now I just repeat. I'm gonna go around the perimeter of the building. I'm gonna to go to each corner each 90 degree corner because that's a place a mason is always going to want to start. It's more efficient for them to start from a 90 than some sort of a bizarre, you know, 35 degree angle. I'll pull from the 90s. I'll find the center of the first cell 12 inches in from outside a face and then 48 inches on center or less from there depending on the length of the wall and how I can get the stem wall held down to the footing really, really securely. So with the layout in, the template set, everything sturdy, we know the verts are going to be in the right spot. If we follow the layout, it's time to put the verts in. These verts are J-bars. They're bent to somewhere near a 90. I wish they were a little more of a 90. The tails are projecting horizontally and are tied to the longitudinal bar at the bottom. You alternate. I'm alternating as per the plans, a direction on the tails. You want a secure tie against a longitudinal bar. You want a secure saddle tie, if you can manage it, against a template. You want the bar in good contact with the template, so when the rod's being pumped in and, and uh, screeded around, they don't dislodge. You want them coming up pretty plumb, not perfectly plumb, but fairly plumb. And so you arrange this however you can and uh, get it done you know, any way that you can. These long verts are hard to do without a helper. So if you can bring somebody out to hold those up, so much the better.
Now, if you live in any kind of a big urban environment, there are going to be rebar suppliers that will not only sell you the rebar, but they'll provide all the cuts and bends. And if you have some cages or some, you know, if you have some rebar structures that go inside some elaborate concrete structure, they'll even tie those cages or even mats up for you and they make it happen at light speed. And so sometimes it's a cost effective way to go. If you don't have that sort of a, a service provider, you're going to be cutting and bending this stuff however you can. You can cut it with a torch, you can cut it with a hot saw, you can cut it with a rebar cutter bender, which really makes the bending a lot easier. There are, there are electric over hydraulic rebar cutters, there are angle grinders, I mean there's a lot of ways to do it. However you do it, there's going to be sparks, probably. So protect your eyes, wear some gloves because it will cut you, it gets hot after it's been cut. Pay attention because rebar is really not safe until it's until it's securely encased in concrete and until, until then it's always got teeth. The wire has teeth. It's, you're going to bleed a little bit if you start living as a rod buster, but eh, we ain't got time to bleed much. There, th this is not a complicated rebar job. There are only three sizes. Number three bar, number four bar, number five bar. That designation is speaking to the number of eighths of an inch in diameter that these bars are. We've got some number three bar stirrups around some little cages for some short sonar tube columns. We have some number five bar verts that come up inside those sonar tube columns. And the rest of it, the longitudinal bars and the vertical bars are all number four, which is half inch bar. All of this is specified by Dave Thomas, my engineer. He did the math, he understood the forces and the stresses and the tensile strength that's needed and how much and where the rebar needs to be placed and we're just reading his instructions and complying and the inspector will verify that and uh, we'll move forward and be ready to pour this thing in just a couple days. Be careful Leo, it's dangerous around here man. <laughs> So even though this rebar has got a little rust on it, it doesn't have much rust on it. And even though it's got a little dirt on some of the ends, it doesn't, it's not caked with mud. And you got to pay attention to that because a piece of rebar that's covered with rust has got the void between it and the concrete that the rust creates. And once the rust has started, it's going to go wild, right? So you don't want that to happen. And if a rebar, piece of rebar is covered with, with mud, I mean, if it's laying in the mud alongside your forms and you pick it up and tie it in, How's the concrete going to get adhesion to that rebar, which is vitally important for it to get its development strength, you know, around the deformations on that bar? So the moral of the story is that even though rebar is rough and it's dirty, it's not very dirty. And it's only dirty with the mill scale and not with the debris and the oil. Keep the oil off of it, for crying out loud, so that the concrete really, really gets a hold of that rebar.